Good morning, CBPC family. I invite you all to come on in, find your seats. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or downstairs in overflow or joining us online via live stream, it is our joy and our privilege to worship with you today. My name is Brad Voiles. I'm one of the elders here. And to my left is Pastor Dennis Lewis. To my right, Scott Finch, our director of music worship. It's our privilege to lead you all today. I'll point out to you that the call to worship is responsive today, so pay attention to that. Here now, our meditation from Jonah chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Beloved of God and heirs of the promise of salvation, let us rise before the Lord our God as we come before him to worship him in spirit and in truth. Our call to worship today is taken from Jonah 2.9. Hear now the words of the Lord. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. Salvation belongs to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. We now sing our opening hymn, All People That on Earth Do Dwell.
Amen, indeed. You may be seated. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, indeed, as we come before you, we thank you for who you are and for what you have done toward your people. Father, indeed, all people that on earth do dwell are called to worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you so much that you have provided for us a place for worship. Thank you that you've provided for us a a season and a time for us to come before you and lift up your precious name and proclaim your goodness throughout all the world. Father, please meet with your people today. Grant us the gift of your presence that we might be renewed Grant us the gift in your presence that we might be washed by the water of the word. Father, please grant to us a measure of your spirit that we might be revived in our hearts and in our thinking. What a gift worship is to your people. I pray that we might savor it, that we might taste and see that it is good, that through the songs that we sing, through the liturgy, through the preaching of your word, your people are encouraged. Your people are built up and rooted in truth. Thank you for your good, marvelous, and wonderful grace toward us as we have gathered here today to worship. Father, we pray for our congregation. We thank you for the men and women that have gathered here today and those that are watching at home that name the name of Christ. We thank you for our fellowship, that it is sweet and that it is good. Teach us to love one another deeper. Teach us to care for one another rightly. We thank you, O Lord, for the blessing that our gathered worship has been to this community and how we have drawn closer together as a people as a result. Father, help us indeed to minister to one another in our needs. There are many that are hurting. We think of Anna Mar and the fact, O Lord, um, the loss of her husband. We continue to pray for her comfort. Thank you for those that have rallied around her and loved her well. Lord, there are many that are sick and ailing. We pray that we might attend to their needs. Those that are financial need, I thank you, Lord, that we've been able to provide for many. Put us in a place, Lord, where we can provide for many more and provide um, those daily bread that is so needed. Lord Jesus, we pray now for our country and still gripped by the coronavirus as cases still spread and people are still dying. Lord, I pray that you might again stay the, stay the plague. May your mighty hand prevent it from spreading at such a fast rate. Give those wisdom that um, are in high risk that they might take the necessary precautions. Father, we also pray for our leaders, that you might give them wisdom, that you might give them um, the wisdom that is needed to enact proper and good and sensible laws to prevent the spread of the virus, but also at the same time be able, that basic necessities are still able to be gotten. Lord, we remember also that in our country we're still gripped by uh, protest, many of it peaceful, some of it violent. Lord, still the unrest that is going on and racial tension being inflamed and profited on by others. Father, I pray that you might bring a spirit of peace to our country. May it be led by your people as we love all men and as we care for those that are afflicted, that our love and our wisdom may be seen by all. Father, we thank you that your spirit is still working in here today, drawing men and women to you. I pray that might be the case even today. And now, Lord, teach us to pray as you've taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
has been our practice, our tradition in the past on Sundays BC, that is before Corona, to have times of sharing, times of testimony um, from brothers and sisters to one another. Uh, we've maintained that tradition in, in some form or another as families have submitted testimonies to be read. And so it's my privilege today to read of a testimony during this time of Corona from the Wallach family. So Travis and Ashley, we thank you for this. This stay at home time was no doubt providentially planned for us by our Father in heaven. He has shown us the true order of the love, prayer, discord, sometimes chaos within our family and even with him. He has exposed ourselves and shown us where we stood. We are all works in progress and adapting is a motto and form of grace we try to extend to each other often. And amidst our trials, we have felt the goodness and mercy of the Lord pursuing us. Pastor Dennis has also reminded us, are we not a blessed people? We Wallachs have surely been blessed by this extended family time set from the beginning of time. Still we cry out, why Lord? How long Lord? What are you doing? We hold fast to the promise that he is working out all things for the good of those who believe. And we have tried to remember to lean not on our own understanding, but trust in the Lord, especially when it comes to our oldest son, Zev, being separated from us geographically. As most of you know, we share joint custody of our 13-year-old son, Zev, who, when he's not here with us, is in New Mexico. To help you truly understand God's perfect provisions, we'll go back some time before COVID-19 became a household name. Zev had been spending some time with us during a break last year, and on the day before departure, the Williams family stopped by to say their goodbyes for now. In typical Peyton fashion, he so casually asked a profound question, are you praying boldly? That very day, we both realized and were convicted that we were not. We were not praying boldly for the Lord to move mountains and bring us together with Zev for longer periods of time. In our minds, we could not possibly see this happening without a lot of pain and heartache for Zev. Something dramatic would have to happen. How could we pray for this? Our faithful father began to open our eyes and our hearts. He gave us courage to pray boldly. On March 12th of this year, we sat discussing what was best for Zev as news headlines began to litter every space. Zev had a flight in the morning to come for his two-week spring break visit with us. We came to the conclusion that if Zev's mom was comfortable with the travel plans, we would move forward. Zev arrived March 13th, the same day everything shut down. A week in, and we realized flying him back would not be ideal or even possible. Within 24 hours of this conversation, Zev's mom called to tell us she thought it would be best for Zev to stay put. Weeks turned into months, four months and a day to be exact. I hope you're hearing and seeing not only how our good God works in and through all things, but he granted us eyes to see the gifts he was laying before us. It's important to note that his home in New Mexico is unbelieving. The cards just fall where they fall. It's also important to note how easy the conversations with Zev's mom have been through this time. How even though she may be unbelieving, we have seen the Lord give her a peace and even wisdom. And Zev has seen our church community love and support him. On his birthday in April, as the cars rolled by with balloons, confetti, and necklaces, and words of celebration were shouted, he wept. He was overwhelmed by the love. He said to me, I can't believe they did that for me. They don't even know me, but I know they love me. I truly believe that not that night he began to understand the love our Father has for him and the ways he can display it. He was granting Zev eyes to see. We've been praying for a very long time for Zev to have a Christian friend to walk through life with. Again, we didn't have eyes to see until now. Zev and Ian Gregory had an instant connection when they met several years ago and always picked right back up every time they reunited. This period of time this year seemed different. It wasn't just a connection to some sport. They became each other's support. It has been a joy to watch their bonds become stronger by the day. There was certainly a lot of wrestling in the pool, but you would often find them floating side by side, chatting away. Zev has always said he's okay with how things are, here with us for breaks in summer, because he has soccer and school to occupy his time in New Mexico. 
A few days before we were to meet his mom somewhere in Texas, his school announced they would be 100% online this fall and all sports would be canceled. It's hard to not be anxious for Zev to see all the things he relied on being canceled. But when we list out how perfect and timely these last four months have been, it is hard not to be waiting expectantly for the Lord to reveal the next step. We are so thankful that the Lord so graciously placed us in this CVPC community. Please pray boldly alongside of us, Ashley and Travis. So we thank you, Ashley and Travis, for sharing your heart in this, for sharing this good news. We, as brothers and sisters, need to be generous in sharing what the Lord is doing. I'm mindful of the the father in, in the Gospel of Mark who says, I believe, help my unbelief. And sometimes the very way the Lord chooses to help our unbelief is to hear from others, to have our faith strengthened when our faith is weak because we hear of how the Lord is working in other people's lives. So I encourage us as brothers and sisters to not withhold, but to share. I ask us now to stand and sing our song of preparation, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul, on page two of your order of work. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 14, Psalm 14. I told the, <clears throat> told the morning group 
that um, this song is such a beautiful song, and it reminds us of the importance of faith and what we have as believers in Christ, that we have a refuge for our weary souls. So praise the Lord indeed that this is true. This morning, uh, I'm going to look at Psalm 14, and Psalm 14 is a little bit different from the Psalms that we've been looking at as we continue our Summer in the Psalms series. The first Psalm we looked at is Psalm 23. We did about three sermons in that, in which we looked at the, the grace and the beauty of the imagery of what it means for God to be our shepherd. Then, of course, in Psalm 100, uh, we did about two Sundays in that, And Psalm 100 is this magisterial depiction of true worship of the living God and its beauty and in its grace. And we saw what is required of us in worship. Now we come to Psalm 14, and it's a little bit different. It's it's more along the lines of wisdom literature. If you think of Psalm 14, think of it as wisdom literature. And one of the beauties of Psalm 14, and of course it's parallel, Psalm 53 is that it reminds us of unbelief. In fact, today's sermon is entitled, Understanding Unbelief, Understanding What It Means to Be an Unbeliever. Now, if you read through Psalm 14, Psalm 14 reads in part like a lament, as someone looking at the state of his society and saying, Lord, look at the fools who do not believe that there is a God. But I think in many ways, Psalm 14 is also a testimony. And perhaps the psalmist is saying in and of himself that I, I was once this fool who did not believe in God. And of course, the blessed reality of this text is found in verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad that there is a restoration for the soul that happens, even though the soul might be in a state where they don't believe that there is a God. Yet God has promised salvation would come for Israel, for his people out of Zion. What a wonderful text. Happy that I'm uh, able to be up here and talk about it as we look at the nature of unbelief. And as I told them, the group this morning, that unbelief is, the, is one of those things that's not just true of unbelievers, but all of us struggle with unbelief at one point or another. That the process of salvation in one sense is static, it's, it's completed, but in another sense it's happening. And the fact that unbelief dwells in our heart is a good reason why we need to understand the very nature of unbelief. Um, as I also told the group this morning, that unbelief can be found in our homes. It can be found when we go to the store. It can be found at our work. Everywhere we go, we meet people that have an unbelieving heart. And so we need to understand what unbelief is and at its core, how we could address that and how we could bring people that were once fools that say there is no God into the wisdom of God that makes one wise to salvation. So now let's look at this text, Psalm 14. Hear now the words of the Lord. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge." Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. All flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass will wither and the flower will fade, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. 
And this is the word that will be preached unto you. Amen and amen. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the blessedness of your word. Father, I thank you for being a refuge for our weary souls. Be with us now, O Lord, as we contemplate the richness of your grace and your mercy. Bless us now, your people, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Gospel writer Matthew records a scene after Jesus Christ had been born in which a group of men from the east traveled a very long way. And these men were incredibly intelligent men. Uh, These men were great learners. In fact, they were skilled in various different fields, fields of science and theology, and philosophy. They were brilliant men when it came to geography and astronomy. These men um, had a belief, their hearts had a belief, that the Christ child was born. And so they employed all of their intelligence, they employed all all of their knowledge and understanding in all these different fields. And the Bible says that for many months, they traveled a very long distance to go and see the Christ child. And after some, uh, a bit of diplomacy, they ended up finding uh, where the Christ child was born, and they brought him gifts, and the gifts are recorded as gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but we know that there were many more gifts that they probably uh, brought in. And the scriptures call these men what? Wise men. They were wise men. Now, why would the scriptures do that? Why would the scriptures call these men wise men? Well, they were wise because they had a wise mindset. And that wise mindset was that they were going to search after the Christ. That they will spare no expense, no time. There was nothing too difficult for them. They employed all of their being toward one simple task, and that is to seek out the Savior, no matter what. Now contrast these wise men who spent so much, who went through so much to seek after Christ, to what we find in verse number 1 of Psalm 14, where the scriptures tell us that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. What makes the fool a fool? Well, he says that there is no God. Instead of spending his time and his energy and all of his efforts in pursuit of God, the fool does the opposite. He spends all of his time, energy, and effort denying the very existence of God, though it is made perfectly plain to him by all that he sees. And beloved, believe me today that all of us at one point or another fall into this category of the fool. Even though we are Christians, the majority of us in this room and downstairs and might be watching, the reality is foolishness is bound up in our hearts. And from time to time we come to a place where we adopt the foolish mindset and deny the living God of heaven. But it's also the case that you and I know people that are unbelievers. And the Bible and the psalmist is telling us that we need to understand the very nature of being a fool. So that number one, we can guard foolishness when we see it and find it in our hearts. But also, we can be a source of apologetic towards those that are foolish. And that we can bring them to Christ. And so what I want to do is I want to ask three questions today and answer those three questions. And here are the three questions relating to understanding unbelief. The first is this, what does it mean to be a fool? That's important because the Bible says that a fool says in his heart there is no God. The second is this, what causes causes a fool to act foolishly? If you read verse number 2 all the way down to verse number 6, you'll see a litany of behaviors that are based or uh, harken back to that of being a fool. What causes those behaviors? And lastly, how does a fool become wise? What does God use in our lives to bring us back to a place of wisdom, 
to make us wise unto salvation? Those are the three questions that we're going to ask today and uh, where I'm going to attempt to answer them. All right, so let's take the first one. What does it mean to be a fool? Well, look at this passage. It says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And, you know, in our day, when you call someone a fool, that's like fighting words, right? You know, if somebody calls you a fool, uh, you know, your feelings get hurt. You think, man, uh, you know, intellectually I've been cut down. Um, You feel bad that you're ignorant or don't know that much. But in the Bible, that's not the exact understanding of fool. In fact, the Bible has many different ways for us to understand exactly what the fool is. Especially in the Old Testament, there are like five words that the Old Testament used for fools or to describe a fool, and all of them are nuanced. And in some way, shape, or form, all of us exhibit these qualities. So here here are the five. The first one is called the simple fool. Now, the simple fool are those that are gullible, you know, they're vulnerable, they're immature, they're like the children inside here today and the young people. No offense, uh, you know, don't, don't take too much offense in that. But, but the Bible calls uh, young people especially fools, the simple fool. And why is that? Well, because they just lack wisdom. They do foolish things. They're immature. In fact, the writer of the Proverbs says that the Proverbs were written to give subtlety to the simple or the simple fool. And so to the young man, knowledge, or young woman, knowledge and discretion. And so one of the the ways in which the Bible says that we can be fools is just being a simple fool. So we're gullible, and we're naive, and we don't understand uh, the things of this world. And the only way to overcome being a simple fool is by consistent knowledge and instruction from God's Word, specifically in the wisdom literature. Now here's the second one. The second one is the silly fool. And this is the one who believes that he is right in his own eyes. Brad Boyles just told me this is probably the sophomore, right? The wise fool. The one who thinks that he or she knows uh, everything. And so because of that, they're wise in their own eyes. And the Proverbs warns us of this. Proverbs 12, 15. There's a way of a fool is right in his own eyes. They don't accept wisdom, argumentation, and persuasion, and knowledge, and uh, logic uh, doesn't faze them. They just believe that they are right in their own eyes. And the only way to persuade them is by harsh punishment. The third kind of fool is the kind of fool in which if the silly fool is not dealt with properly, they become the sensual fool. And the sensual fool is one who is even more foolish in the sense that he is full of guile. The Bible describes this kind of fool as being shameless, the one who seeks after foolishness. In Proverbs 10, 23, it says, It is a sport to this kind of fool, this sensual fool, to do mischief. He delights in it. He's excited by doing foolishness constantly. And the Bible warns us against this type of foolishness. The third type of fool is the scoffing fool. This is the one who turns up his nose at people and looks down on people. The writer of the psalmist in Psalm 1 warns us of these kinds of people, that we are warned not to sit in the seat of the scornful, the one who looks down on other people. And this is the scoffing fool. The final kind of fool is the steadfast fool. This is the most dangerous kind of fool, in fact, and this is the kind of fool that is mentioned in Psalm 14. This is the kind of fool that one commentator describes as this. This type of fool is self-confident and close-minded. He is his own God, freely gratifying his lower nature. In other words, what this commentator is saying is that the kind of fool, the steadfast fool, the fool that's mentioned in Psalm 14 and verse 1, is the kind of fool that believes himself to be God. And so he rejects any notion or any understanding of who God is. And the Bible says this is the worst kind of fool because this is the fool who stands up and says, there is no God. Worse, this is the kind of fool fool that says, I don't need God because I know better than God. And I can live my life just fine. In fact, the Bible says the embodiment of this fool is Nabal or Nabal. And we find him in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And most of us remember the story of Nabal. How he was this wealthy landowner that had a bunch of sheep. And uh, David and his men protected his land and, and protected his sheep and prevented them from getting harmed. 
And instead of him providing for um, David and his men, the Bible says that he ridiculed David and he belittled David and he treated them very poorly. And the Bible says the reason why he was a fool is because he was willfully blind and destructively blind towards the way of the world. He knew that it was his responsibility to care for those who had protected his sheep. He knew that it was his responsibility to provide for those that are in need, but he did not do it. And because of that, he is branded as a fool, the epitome of a fool. Well, beloved, uh, when the Bible says the fool says in his heart there is no God, it's saying the same thing, that the foolish person is willfully blind to the world, that the foolish person knows that there is a God. The foolish person knows that they're supposed to worship God, and yet they refuse to do it. They're refusing to do it. And why are they refusing to do it? Well, it's because the foolish person, in terms of his heart, has allowed his emotions to control his thinking. That's why the text says, a fool says in his heart there is no God. Notice it doesn't say a fool says in his mind there is no God. Or a fool reasons that there is no God. Because there's no such thing. No one truly uses their reason and logic to come to the conclusion that there is no God. That's why the psalmist emphasized that it's a heart matter. And by emphasizing that it is a heart matter, the psalmist is getting to the fact that a fool denies God based solely on their emotions and their feelings. They're ruled by their emotions and their feelings. This came home to me in a story I read about Martin Lloyd-Jones, um, the famous English preacher. Martin Lloyd-Jones says a highly intelligent man once came to him and said, I don't believe in God. And Martin Lloyd-Jones asked him, why? Why don't you believe in God? And the man began to tell Martin Lloyd-Jones a story about how his wife uh, grew uh, gravely ill. And how during the process of his wife becoming gravely ill, he had an emotional response to that. And he said, because of that, God doesn't exist. And Martin Lloyd-Jones asked him, well, wait a minute. I mean, the tragedy that you have is, is painful and it's harmful. But why are you making such a big claim based on such flimsy evidence? And the flimsy evidence is just how he felt. Martin Lloyd-Jones reminded him that the psalmist said it was good to be afflicted. Why? Because before I was afflicted, I went astray. And so what was Martin Lloyd-Jones doing? Martin Lloyd-Jones was reminding him that we cannot trust our feelings and our emotions because they go up and down and they're not a good determiner of whether or not God is real or if our faith is real. In fact, the exact opposite. And so Martin Lloyd-Jones reminded this man that perhaps God was doing something else through the process of this suffering. And so the man said, oh, I guess that could be true. And the man changed and and accepted Christ as a result. Now, what is it that we learn from this story? What we learn from this story is that our emotions change and they go up and down. And our our friends that we have, when they say things like they don't believe in God, it's not on intellectual grounds, but it's based poorly on emotions. And I've seen this happen time and time again, where if you trace back people's unbelief, you could trace it all the way back to an event. Something awful happened in their life. Either they were abused or either they were taken advantage of or something happened that led them down to a path to believe that God doesn't exist. But beloved, the Bible says that that's a foolish way to reason. Because our hearts are not a good determiner of whether or not God exists or that he loves us. As I told the group this morning today, our emotions and the state of our heart changes like the weather in the valley. You know, I was shocked every time I, when I first came here. It's like it's sunny one day and it's pouring down rain the other. And sometimes it's on the same day. It's hard to make plans, right? Because every time the weather is changing, well, our emotions are like that. And I woke up this morning and I was in a good mood. And by the time I came to church, I wasn't in such a good mood. All of a sudden, I'm in a good mood again, and it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, that's the state of our heart. That's the state of our emotions. Sometimes you love your spouse passionately, and sometimes you don't. And sometimes you love your children passionately, and sometimes you don't. It's just this constant roller coaster. 
except me. I, I, you know, I always love my wife. If you're watching, hon, yes, so you know. Um, but, but, but the reality is this. The reality is this. Don't trust your emotions. Only a fool does that. Only a fool relies on his emotions and how he feels to determine whether or not God exists. And so we are warned. That's the definition of a fool. He says in his heart because he's ruled by his heart, the emotions that swells up in his heart. We ought not, as God's people, to do that. Notice the second thing, though. What causes fools to act foolishly? That's important. What causes fools to act foolishly? Now, the rest of the psalm is taken up with a litany of offenses that the fool commits as a result of his unbelief. But Old Testament scholar Robert Alter states that there's a step before an outright denial of God. And here's what Robert Alter says, and this was so important in helping me understand the the true nature behind why unbelievers do the things that they do, and why sometimes me as a Christian do the things that he does. And here's what Robert Alter says. He says the thrust of this line, and he's talking about verse uh, verse number one of Psalm 14. He said the thrust of this line is more moral than theological. The concern is not a philosophical question of God's existence, but the scoundrels or the fool's lack of conscience. Now pause there for a moment. Here's what Robert Alter is saying that I think is so important. He's saying that before the fool comes to a place where he's denying that there is a God, the fool's conscience has been seared. The fool has a lack of a conscience. Now, Pastor Dennis, you might be asking, what is the conscience? Well, Paul describes the conscience in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. This is what Paul says. He says, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. He's talking about the unbeliever. While their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So from this, we hear the nature of the conscience is that thing that accuses us but also it excuses us. It tells us right from wrong. Your conscience is that part of your being that tells you whether or not uh, you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And when we establish ourselves as our own God, when we want to do something in our life, uh, what do we do? Well, we rationalize it by ignoring our conscience. How many of us have ever done something against our conscience? Think about it. Think about the last time you've done something against your conscience. How do you feel? Well, you should feel awful. I mean, nobody should be, uh, nobody should go against their conscience and feel good about it. Um, I'll never forget this. I was in, um, I was in college, and um, I think I was a sophomore, so I was a wise fool at this time, and I was taking history too, because it's the second part of semester. And I remember um, I really wanted to get an A in this class because like everyone in college, at least a sophomore at that time, I wanted good grades. And I had good grades at that time, but I hit a rough patch and I wasn't studying the way I needed to. And so, man, I was in a pinch, you know, and it was right to where I needed A's all the way through to get an A in this class. So I'm sitting down and we had this quiz. And I was right in the back of this guy who I knew was a stud in the class. I mean, you know, he didn't even need to study. He just, he just, he went at it all the time. And I'll never forget, as I was sitting down there, I, I got stuck on a few questions, and I glanced over at his, at his work, and I cheated off of him. Some of you are looking at me, Pastor Dennis, you cheated? Yeah, because I'm a sinner. And so I cheated off of him, and um, they marked our scores, and I, I got 100. I remember just the Lord struck my heart. I mean, I still remember it to this day. I just, I mean, this feeling of just conviction. The Lord was just telling me, this is wrong. You shouldn't have done this. You know you shouldn't have done this. And I just couldn't let it go. And I didn't wait a week. I didn't wait two weeks. I, I right after the class, because you graded it in the class, right after the class, I went up front. And I, I told the teacher, I said, listen, I... I said, this quiz, um, I I deserve a zero because I cheated. I cheated on this quiz. And I told him what happened, and so he said, thank you for telling me. And I was expecting him to say, oh, it's okay, you told the truth. He gave me a zero on the quiz. (laughs) He gave me a zero on the quiz. It's like, no grace, all law here, right? But I'm glad he did. I'm glad he did. Because hear me today, had I not said anything, 
I don't think I could have lived with myself, right? Because that's what the conscience is supposed to do. Your conscience is supposed to convict you of wrongdoing. That's why the Christian can't do anything in secret, you know? Sometimes my children, they run off in the corner and they turn off the lights and, you know, they, they, they're on computers or whatever and they know they're not supposed to. And they think that just because they're in the corner and nobody's watching, it's okay. No, for the Christian, you're never in the corner. For the Christian, you might not be in your household. And, and for the Christian, you might think nobody's looking, but you have a conscience. And that conscience is designed to prick you and prod you towards uh, what is right and just. And what the Bible is saying here is that the fool, before he dives into unbelief, gets to a place in his life where he's ignoring his conscience. He doesn't tell anybody that he's cheated. And he doesn't tell his wife that he's lusting after other women. And he doesn't tell his employer that he's cheating on them. And, and in the aggregate, as the fool goes on and on and on, he keeps ignoring his conscience and ignoring his conscience to the point that his conscience becomes seared. And therefore, therefore, he slips into unbelief. Because once you deny your conscience that is given to you by God, the next step is denying God. And that's what this passage is teaching. So, beloved, hear me today. Do not deny your conscience. Do not sear your conscience. If God is pricking you and God is telling you that your behavior or what you're doing is wrong or you need to be doing something, do it. Because that is the mechanism by which we stay and become wise. But if we deny our conscience and we don't listen to when our conscience pricks us, then we slip into unbelief. Now, let me say this too. It's important to have an informed conscience. Because if you have a weak conscience and you don't rely on filling your conscience with the word of God, that can lead you into error as well. Because I've known many people in the name of Christianity, in the name of the Bible, they have a weak conscience and they cause people to sin or themselves to sin. So your conscience needs to be informed by God's word. But independent of that, you have a conscience that tells you what is right and wrong. Do not deny it, because that's one step away from denying the God of the Bible. Now, notice the logic of the psalmist here. The logic of the psalmist is this. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. He's, he's overcome by emotion. He's ruled by his own desires. That causes him to deny his conscience. His conscience becomes seared. And then right after his conscience becomes seared, he denies God. That's the logic that the psalmist is going through. And right after he denies God, look at the works he engages in. It's right there in the passage. Notice what happens when you and I come to a place where our conscience is seared and we deny God. The Bible says we become corrupt. We do abominable deeds, verse number one. Number two, the Bible says we slip into a place of further not understanding. Verse number three, we begin to turn aside. In other words, we begin to turn away from what is right more and more. Then the Bible goes on to say that they don't do what is good. In fact, they despise doing what, what is good. And then in verse number four, they have no knowledge not only that, but they destroy the people of God. The Bible, look, notice the imagery here. They eat God's people like bread. And then at the end of verse number four, they do not call upon the Lord. In other words, they don't pray. They don't pray. Can I tell you one of the ways in which Christians need to be careful that they're not slipping into foolish, foolishness and unbelief is they need to check their prayer life. Unbelievers don't pray. Believers are supposed to pray, and we're supposed to pray often, not just over meals or during special times, but the Bible calls us to have a spirit of prayer at all times. Notice verse number five, that uh, the foolish person, the unbelieving person, the person who has their conscience seared and don't listen to their conscience, the Bible says um, there they are in great terror. In other words, they're fearful people. They stay in constant fear. They're always troubled. They're always lurk, looking at what's lurking behind the shadows, right? They're in constant and great terror. 
Notice the final thing in verse number six. They're always trying to hurt people. I remember somebody once told me, hurt people, hurt people. You ever heard it? You ever heard that? That's true. That's true. But I, what I'd like to add to that is foolish hurt people hurt people. Because you're acting like a fool. Now, some of you are saying, well, Pastor Dennis, what are you trying to say? That only Christians can be moral? Only Christians have the capacity to do what's right? Well, no. Actually, didn't expect me to say that, huh? Threw you a curveball there. No, of course not. No, Christians aren't the only people that can do right. Unbelievers can do right as well. It's called common grace. They have the capacity to do right. But you might be saying, well, Pastor Dennis, if there's no difference between the believer and the unbeliever, if, if unbelievers can do good and, and believers can do good, then what's the point of being a believer? Well, here's the point. The difference between the believer and the unbeliever when it comes to good works is manifested whenever trials come. Whenever trials come. Several years ago, uh, me and a group got together and we started studying the problem of evil. And in the process of studying the problem of evil, we started studying the time of the Holocaust. And there were several books that we read, but I remember two of the works stood out, and it was one by Eli Wiesel, um, and it's the book Night. Anybody ever read Night? If you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read it. It's one of the most grif gripping books I've ever read. In fact, um, I read it all in one night. I started early, uh, I started around 10 o'clock, and I thought I'd read it for about two hours, and I couldn't put it down. Because the book just talks about how you and I, like normal people, we would even describe them as good people, do the most horrific things in the midst of trials and testings and tribulations. In fact, in one point of the book, Eli Wiesel wrote this. He says, never shall I forget that night, the first night in the camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Here's what Wiesel was saying, that in the midst of this trial and this testing and tribulation, he lost sight of who God was. And others did as well, and that caused them to commit the most awful atrocities. That they were not only, not only were the guards mean to one another, but fellow prisoners. Contrast that now with Corey Ten Boom, and many of you know her story. And how Corey Ten Boom um, was taken after her family tried to help Jews. Her family was taken into a concentration camp. Her and her sister... Uh, her sister died, and, and later she was known to forgive uh, one of the guards, in, uh, one of the German guards who had particularly treated her poorly. And in the midst of, uh, of all of this, here's what Corey Ten Boom said. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Now, hear me, beloved. Look at the contrast between the two. To the one that didn't hold on to the Lord... His outlook of that time was grim, and he talked about it in a grim and awful fashion, that good people, moral people that we would think of had committed such awful atrocities. But by the same token, Corey Ten Boom, who had held on to God in the midst of trials, she kept her profession. And this is the remarkable, glorious truth of Scripture, that in the midst of trials, you and I tend to fall into one category or the other. We tend to either become fools who deny God and deny the work of the Holy Spirit and forget what God is doing in our lives, or we become like the wise that hold on to the Lord and hold on to His promises in Scripture. Those are the only two things that happen. And there are many of you today might be going through a trial. This is an opportunity that you have. I know many in the midst of COVID-19 has provided an opportunity for God's people to reveal the nature of their heart. Are you a fool that denies God, who doesn't take the time to pray and ask the Lord what he's doing in your life and what he would have you to learn during this time? Or are you going to be wise and you're going to sit down and ponder the goodness and the greatness of God in the midst of this trial? Those two things are the things that before you. 
And God's word lets you know the path of the fool. But before we go today, real quick, I want to look at how can a fool become wise. Yes, we've talked about the fool, and we've talked about what it is and what all the fool does, but I want to leave you with some hope because it's hopeful, and it is an encouragement to me when I read verse 7 to see how the fool becomes wise. And here it is in verse number 7. The psalmist gives a lament, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice Let Israel be glad. What is the psalmist saying here? Well, the psalmist is saying that there's hope for the fool. That he doesn't have to stay in a foolish state. The psalmist says that there's there's salvation for Israel. Israel there is God's people. There's salvation for God's people, those that are created in this image. And it would come out of Zion. Beloved, this is prophetic because it's talking about Jesus Christ. And it's talking about the reality that salvation indeed did come out of Zion. Salvation not only came out of Zion, but salvation came out of Nazareth. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he died a fool's death on the cross so that we and I don't have to die the fool's death and suffer the punishment of the fool. That Christ died a fool's death so that you and I can be made wise unto salvation. That Christ Jesus, our Lord, died a fool's death so that you and I can be restored in the image and the knowledge of of himself and of God. The beautiful reality of verse number 7 is that there's hope for the fool if he but turns to Christ. Because all of the ills, all of the punishment, all of the suffering that the fool will endure as a result of his foolishness was poured upon Christ. And the wisdom, the richness of the wisdom and the, and the wiseness of Christ has now been poured on to the fool, that the fool may be wise. And in the same way, we see the wise men spending their entire time, that season in their life, pursuing after Christ with everything that they have. And finally, when they meet him, they give him all the gifts and talents that they had. It's the same way the Bible says that when you and I meet the Savior, we too now have an existence where everything we do should be in pursuit of Christ to give him all of our, give him all of our gifts and talents in service of him. But we need to come before him and worship. That's the beauty of the gospel, that we don't have to be fools anymore. That we can be wise. Glory to God for what he has done for his people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the richness of your grace. We thank you that you did not leave us in a state of folly, but you delivered us from our foolishness. Father, I thank you for the reality that Christ died a fool's death so that we, as your people, might be made wise. Help us to... Now use our wisdom, our intellect, our gifts, everything we have in pursuit of the King, that we might serve him and love him with all that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for our next song. Let's sing praise him, praise him.
Beloved, we ought to praise our wonderful Savior. Why? Because he has turned a bunch of fools into wise people. He's made us wise unto salvation. What a glorious thought indeed. We praise him as a result. Christian, give praise to your God for making you wise. And if you know someone that needs the wisdom of God, be sure to share it with them this week and look for ways we can turn fools into wise men and women. Receive now the Lord's benediction. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore so that all the peoples will say, Amen. Our Lord is faithful. Praise the Lord. May you have a wonderful, blessed day, and I will dismiss you by rose.